the Eric, dear colleagues, thanks very much for inviting me to this great meeting. And uh, Margaret already set the pace very nicely. I think it's less of a debate between the two of us. It's more of a debate between us and the surgeons, I think. These are my conflicts of interests. Um, the question is also neoadjuvant treatment for clearly resectable pancreatic cancer. How many PDACs are really clearly resectable? And I think when you look at this, at this line here, you see very nicely that this is really not more than 20% in total because you've got a huge amount of cancers that are borderline or locally advanced. And of course, you've just seen from um, Dr. Tempero's nice presentation that adjuvant treatment has substantially improved. We've doubled the three-year disease-free survival rate almost, and we also have advantage in stage three. We have an advantage in R1 resected tumors with Forferinox, but we have a grade three, four toxicity of 50%, and this is after Whipple's procedure. So this is a more, actually more vulnerable population. And not all patients do qualify for fall Freonox, and in particular, up to 50% of patients never ever get to adjuvant treatment at all in this setting. The reasons are peri- or post-operative complications and reduced ECOG, so patients don't get the treatment. So the best treatment is the one that you get, I think. So what is the near adjuvant treatment supposed to achieve? First of all, we want to improve our zero resection rate, and we have seen from Dr. Strobel's talk that there is a difference in survival between our zero and our one resections. We want to treat early micrometastases, and we want to improve, of course, overall survival, and if possible, cure. And micrometastases is an issue in pancreatic cancer because I believe that the majority of pancreatic cancers are a priori metastatic. And this is a nice, this is a computational work but, uh, from pathology, but this is th what they show is that already a cancer with a two centimeter diameter, and we will all agree that this is a very small tumor we very rarely see, but clearly resectable most likely, has a probability of around about 70% to having micrometastases, which we don't detect by conventional imaging. So there is a high chance of having a metastatic disease which we have to treat systemically and not only locally. The problem of neoadjuvant treatment, and there are some, and I will, would like to address that, we need a definitive diagnosis before treatment. We can resect patients with a lesion in the pancreas. We cannot treat them with chemotherapy without having a diagnosis of cancer. This is a difference. And we need tissue of, uh, or cells, and up to 30% we don't get the diagnosis by uh, core needle biopsy. And this might constitute a potential delay in actually starting the treatment. The question is, are there alternative means, for example, liquid biopsies? And this is a nice paper I've got from Ramon Salazar, and what they could show is that at least uh, circulating cell-free DNA measuring RAS mutations, KRAS mutations, pancreatic cancer, which is supposedly quite easy because 90% of the tumors do have KRAS mutations, is actually not really a good alternative to tissue because of low sensitivity and specificity. You have only 23% detection rate in the plasma compared to 72 detection rate in the tissue. That means you're missing out a lot. So this is not really good. We thought we might actually be better when we combine different means, and these are samples taken out from our new adjuvant trial, the Neonax trial, and we actually examined a cohort of 40 patients with cancer, 15 patients with uh, side branch IPMNs with no worrisome features as a control and age matched, and what we could show is per se uh, the amount of uh, cell-free DNA, the, amount, the, the value of thrombospondin 2 and the value of CN99, and we used the cutoff of CN99 to 55, thrombospondin 42, and the CF DNA of around about 12.6 nanogram per mil, Per se, the sensitivity is not high. If you combine that, you get an accuracy of 90% to actually de-identify pancreatic cancer. So there is means, this is not perfect yet, and we have to test that prospectively, but this, there is means now also from liquid biopsies to really make a definitive diagnosis of pancreatic cancer in due course. And we might not ever need, uh, always need the biopsy in the future. The other question is progress during treatments, and this is a discussion we have with surgeons. They say, when you treat and the patient progresses, you're actually missing out a chance of surgery, and you could, we could have cured the patient, and because it's a resectable disease, and, but you didn't, you actually messed up because of an inefficient, uh, inefficient treatment. I think it the other way around. If a patient progresses under an efficient, we're not talking about single-agent treatment, under an efficient chemotherapy, 
we have a window of opportunity to really see the chemosensitivity of the tumor on the one hand and the aggressiveness of the tumor. And the progress under Folfeinox, I, I think you will all agree, is not a good sign for a tumor with respect to the post-operative scenario. The question is also, is that the case, 25% progress under treatment? These are also data from our NIRAX trial we presented at ASCO. And what we could show is, in our trial at least, and this is only two cycles of uh, gemcitabine napaclitaxel prior to surgery, we did not see relevant progress. We had two patients with small liver metastases detected at surgery, but this is similarly to what you see in the APEC trial with 30% of patients actually dropping from the trial because of immediately showing up post-operative micrometastases or small liver metastases. And there was one patient with an uncontrolled cholestasis that actually had to leave the trial, but otherwise there was no major difference. What about toxicity? We could also detect no major difference in the toxicity, in perioperative morbidity. There was no mortality in the trial, but perioperative morbidity uh, when patients got neoadjuvant treatment. And this is similarly to what we see in larger analysis. This is a large data set, a systematic review of 30 trials, surgery only as compared to neoadjuvant treatment. And when you compare the numbers, there is no major difference with respect to gastric emptying, pancreatic fistula, leaky anastomosis, bleeding, infections, or mortality. There was only a slightly higher risk for venous thromboembolism, and this, but this can be simply covered with anticoagulation. So, there is no significant increase in the complication rate. So we can actually assure the surgeons we, act, we are doing something that does not compromise quality or complications of the surgical procedure. And what does the statistics say? We have not so many trials yet. This is a Markov model. This is a literature search from 2002-2015. 22 trials fulfilled the criteria. And what these statistics say that the near, in the near adjuvant there was a higher life expectancy, 32.2 versus 26.7 months, a higher quality adjusted life expectancy, and this is very similar to the data we have in case series. Another, in this case a propensity score matched analysis from the National Cancer Database of the United States, compared 15,000 cases without um, with upfront surgery and 2,104 cases with neoadjuvant treatment, and they did a propensity score matching, three to one. And first of all, they could show that you get a downsizing. We have an effect on a T stage, on the lymph nodes, and the R status. You get more R0 resections, you get smaller tumors, and you get um, less lymph node involvement. And what you also get, this is a as a predictor of mortality, there is a significant effect of the neoadjuvant treatment, which amounts to the same degree as the T-stage lymph nodes resection margin or adjuvant treatment for that sake. And when we now look at the Kaplan-Meier curves, we see a hazard ratio of 0.72 in favor of, uh, of neoadjuvant treatment as compared to upfront resection. And if we then look into upfront resection plus adjuvant treatment as compared to new adjuvant treatment, there is still a hazard ratio of 0 0.83. So there is, seems to be a benefit in this treatment. Um, of course, we need efficacious treatment. It's not, we need the best treatment possible because only when you have a good response, you get also a good outcome later on. And this is shown here. The tumor response is paramount for this treatment. This is just one of the papers with neoadjuvant fulfurinox. I summarized that here in this box. You have a good response rate, even in a neoadjuvant setting to fulfurinox, and a zero resection rate of almost 94%. The response rate, 60%. A pathologic complete resection, round about 6%. Liver metastasis during surgery detected even after Folfrinox 15%, but this is something we still actually are missing, really a better way to assess small liver metastases preoperatively. And the median overall survival was 33.4% 33 with a grade 3, 4 tox preoperatively of 50%. This is the phase three trials, not a randomized. This is the, the Dutch trial where they compared surgery plus adjuvant gemcitabine, the conventional treatment, and uh, in the experimental arm, they had gemcitabine plus gemcitabine-based chemoradiation followed by surgery and adjuvant gemcitabine treatment. And what they found was the resection rate in the experimental arm was only 60%, but it was also only 72% in the surgical arm. 
but the R0 resection rate doubled from 31 to 63 percent. So that made a major improvement, and the serious adverse events, were, there was no significant difference. And when they looked at overall so disease-free survival in the intention to treat, they could show a significant benefit in favor of the neoadjuvant treatment. This, the same was true for distance metastasis-free survival and also for local regional recurrence-free interval. In the intention to treat, there was a trend towards an uh, improvement in overall survival, and those who actually got resected did benefit from the neoadjuvant treatment. So the Priopunk study with a very simple scheme and not very efficacious chemotherapy in combination with radiotherapy supports the concept of neoadjuvant treatment. And we have also another trial. This is a trial from Japan that has, presented, has been presented at this year's GI ASCO. And what they showed is also that uh, compared adjuvant versus neoadjuvant treatment, gemcitabine plus S1, neoadjuvant setting versus S1 in the adjuvant setting. And you know the S1 data are excellent for the adjuvant scenario. 180 patients in each arm. The primary endpoint was resection rate in the phase two part and did a very nice phase two part because they wanted to show whether resection rate was really up to standard when they would do a neoadjuvant treatment. And what you see is 93% of the patients really got resected in the neoadjuvant arm. So this was actually appropriate. And so they went on to the phase three and this is the overall survival. And what you see is there was a significant benefit. 36.72 months as compared to 26.65 months in overall survival, hazard ratio of 0.72, two-year survival rate 63% versus 52%. Of course, these are data from Japan with chemotherapy that is not frequently used for pancreatic cancer in uh, Caucasian patients, but still I think these are very promising data. And when you look at the forest plots, there is an advantage in all the subgroups in favor of neoadjuvant therapy apart from T2 tumors, but this is a very high confidence interval due to low number of patients. The grade three to four toxicity in the neoadjuvant setting was 70%, but it was mostly leukopenia and neutropenia. There was no difference in surgical morbidity, and there were significantly more N0 patients in the neoadjuvant group. So I think when we should conclude now is neoadjuvant treatment the way to go? I think definitely yes. We have quite a few trials on the horizon because the field is moving and the question is not anymore shall we do it? The question is what shall we use? And I think we will have the answer in due course. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention.